Okay, this is the intro to the recording for the Sabbath service for August 4, 2018, AM to the U.S., PM to the UK. We'll be streaming live on Facebook Live Sabbath service page, and we'll put this recording into the archive on YouTube and Vimeo and on our own site, too. All right, we're going to bring in the Facebook Live crowd. I'll begin the service as soon as we get the green light from Facebook Live. Greetings to those of you watching on Facebook Live. Happy Sabbath for this service for the 23rd day of the fifth month on God's holy sacred calendar. It's the fourth day of August 2018 on the pagan Roman calendar. And this is the Sabbath service AM to the U.S., PM to the UK, and excuse me, I know that uh, I said at the Bible study last night I would plan to do chapter 7 of Mystery of the Ages today, and I may come back and do that later in the day. I really want to press on with that, but I woke up this morning with a head cold, very sore throat, that's why I'm off camera, and I'm just going to give going to give us a quick introduction. We're going to do more of what we did last night. I have two more World Tomorrow telecast videos of Mr. Armstrong speaking, showing the symbols and beast from the book of Revelation. And the first one we'll start with this morning. He'll start out going over the first four seals, the four horsemen. And all of this at this moment in time is very good for us to be uh, not only knowledgeable on and very familiar with, but to have a good understanding of these things. And that was one of the things that God very much gave to his end-time servant, Herbert W. Armstrong, was understanding and you know, I mentioned last night how when he would pound on his desk and say, Brethren, half of you, 90% of you aren't getting it. Even though, brethren, you know, students at the college could answer questions in depth about the four beast, uh, the four, first four seals and the four horsemen and the beast. Still, unless you have understanding and unless you're aware that, look, these things are happening in the news around us. And this fifth seal that's going to be the worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world to this time coming, known or ever after, it's really coming as the worst time of trouble ever. It'll be round three of World War. A lot of you didn't live through World War II. You were born shortly after it or, or some time after it. That was a pretty horrible war. But World War II has just has been called a drop in the bucket compared to what's coming in World War III, where men, unless Christ were to intervene and stop it, mankind would annihilate all life, all flesh from off the face of this earth, all life. And it's going to be a hard, hard time, and it's just in front of us. And once it comes, it's like an animal being caught in a trap. A bear being caught in a trap, like a, caught in a snare. And Christ said in Luke 21, 35, this great tribulation that Mr. Armstrong is going to be talking about, the seals that lead up to that great tribulation, it's coming. And once it comes, it comes like a snare, catches everybody off guard. It's the worst time of trouble ever. Things will not go back, you know, after a few days or a week or a month. To, way, to the way they have been. You know, we've gone through some financial crisis and various things in the past years. You know, gasoline prices rise, and then they've come back down, and and our money nearly blew out. But, ah, then they did something to turn it around. This time, it ain't going to turn around. What's going to happen is going to happen, and it's going to be downhill from there. Uh, so let's watch Mr. Armstrong give the information on this this morning. Uh, desiring not only the knowledge and information about it, but understanding, realizing this is about to happen, more so now than ever, you know, much more so now sooner than later. And 
Once it comes like a snare, boom, it's come. So the, all those that are holler say, oh, well, it ain't going to happen because it got delayed. That's God's doing, and it's his option to delay it, and he did it with love for us because we needed it. A lot of us have not overcome the way we should be overcoming. All right, let's go. I, sh- I-, I think you should be ready for, we'll do uh, a couple of these this morning like we did last night. Well, we have two hours, a couple, maybe three, but I, I do want to try and maybe I'll hold it down to two because I do want to try. I want to drink plenty of chicken broth and chicken and turkey broth through uh, this morning and a little bit into the afternoon. And I may come back this afternoon because I'm really wanting us and do the chapter seven on Mystery of the Ages. I have a desire to do that if God will help my throat <clears throat> clear and my head clear because I'd really like to press us through uh, getting through all of the chapters from Mystery of the Ages before the fall festivals start, or at least before the Feast of Tabernacles starts. All right, just a quick reminder. I mentioned this in more detail last night, but this is the 23rd day of the fifth month, so we've got one week to go until the sixth month. And then at the end of the sixth month, on the first day of the seventh month, or, you know, after the sixth month, uh, on the first day of the seventh month that follows is the next feast day, the Feast of Trumpets. And then nine days later, on the tenth day of the seventh month, is the Day of Atonement. And then five days later, the Feast of Tabernacles for a week and a day, ending with the last great day, a separate feast, but the eighth day of the feast. All right. Let me switch this lower third over to um, Mr. Armstrong to mention, put his name up on the screen. <clears throat> and he will be, and I'll, I'll, I'll fade to the video that opens in black. So um, we'll at least have the lower third up there as the video begins. All right, brethren and friends. I'm going to say brethren, even if you're in the audience and not baptized, because if you're here for Sabbath services this morning, you know, we count you as brothers. We count you as part of the brethren, and it's up to you whether you want the spring harvest or not. But uh, brethren, God's end-time apostle, most faithful servant of this Philadelphia era that continues, even after the Laodicean era, will begin after Philadelphia is taken away and after the Great Tribulation begins, which is not here yet, thankfully. Worst time of trouble ever to hit the face of this earth coming. And to under, help us understand the seals and the symbols and the beast that lead up to the great coming Great Tribulation, and here's, here's uh, Herbert W. Armstrong. And I saw uh, when the Lamb had opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, there went out another horse that was red. Power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, behold, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. When he had opened the fourth seal, behold, a pale horse, and the name of him that sat on him was Death, and the grave followed him. Now these four horsemen forecast a tremendous staggering event, a world event that soon now is to explode and to shake this world as it has never been shaken since human beings lived on this earth. The World Tomorrow. The Worldwide Church of God presents The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong.
Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. Just how close are we now to Armageddon? That's not just a religious term, Armageddon. You hear it on newscasts. Reporters speak of it in reporting world events and the things that are happening because they see that we're near the end of things in this world. Just what is Armageddon? Well, Armageddon is a Bible term and is not speaking of a final world war. It's speaking of the final battle in the coming nuclear world war three. But how near are we to it right now? Well, wars are now escalating. And even though events in other parts of the world, in Poland, down in Argentina, and the trouble between them and Britain is occupying a lot of attention recently, there's a tinderbox in the Middle East. I don't have time to go into that just now, but the condition among the Arab nations and Israel is really poised for something very, very great. Many more nations are joining the nuclear club. At least a dozen now have nuclear weapons and most of them have the hydrogen bomb and 35 others are on the way and will have nuclear weapons within two to four years. And then what? What next? Only Bible prophecy can tell you what is going to happen and where we go from now. The one book of prophecy in the Bible, the main book of prophecy perhaps above all others, is the book of Revelation. It's often called the Apocalypse, especially in the Roman Catholic Bible. It is called the Apocalypse. It means a revealing the revelation, and it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, it hasn't been understood. The book of Revelation is pretty largely written in symbolic language. They use symbols not to represent the thing it's really talking about, and you can't interpret that. And only Jesus Christ could interpret it, and so it is called the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ. He is the one uh, to reveal it. And it has been a closed book until now, until the end of the world. God Almighty had intended it to be that way. I'd like to uh, have you notice uh, something clear, clear back in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Some of the writings of the prophet Daniel were closed. They couldn't understand the prophecies until now. We come in the 11th chapter of Daniel to verse 40. It says, and at the time of the end. Now, this is the longest prophecy in all the Bible. It really began in the 10th chapter, which was a sort of an introduction. The main prophecy is in the 11th chapter, and the 12th chapter is the final finish of it. And the three of them are just one long prophecy, you might say. And it continues on into the 12th chapter, the time of the end. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now speaking there of the book of life, and only those, the dead in Christ, as is explained in the New Testament, are going to rise in the resurrection at that time. Daniel heard these things, but he didn't understand them. He said he heard, but he didn't understand, but he was writing it down. And the angel who was telling him these things said, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, the book he was writing, this book of prophecy, and seal the book even to the time of the end. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, what's going to come out of all that you've given me and all that you've shown me? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed and sealed up until the end. Now, at the time of the end, he says, many shall be purified 
and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And at the time of the end, he said, many will be running to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Today you find people are going to and fro in automobiles, in airplanes, in every way. People are running to and fro, and knowledge has been increased so tremendously in this 20th century. In the decade of the 60s, the whole world's fund of knowledge doubled, but the world's troubles doubled also. You know, I've said many times that scientists and educators have said, just give us sufficient knowledge and we'll solve all of our problems and we'll cure all of the world's troubles and evils. And knowledge doubled, but troubles doubled also in that same decade because most of the knowledge was in the area of medicine and technology and it didn't help solve the problems. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Christ. In other words, he's the one who reveals the meaning of the symbols. And he doesn't reveal it in the book of Revelation. But it's interpreted by Jesus in the 24th chapter of Matthew and the 13th chapter of Mark and the 21st of Luke. They are like three reporters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all reporting the same general prophecy or speech of Jesus in their own way. Now, in the book of Revelation, in the sixth chapter, you find a general sequence of events from our time now, I should say from the time of Christ, from the time of Christ up until our time now and on into the future and the time of the second coming of Christ. But it is revealed and explained by Jesus in Matthew 24. So I want to go back to that once again. In Matthew 24, and many times I've gone through that, but now listen once again, let's get this straight. Jesus was in the uh, temple at Jerusalem, and they just come out of the temple, and his disciples had shown him the buildings of the temples and pointed to it and uh, made some remark about it. And he said, well, I want to tell you, those, all these buildings are going to be torn down, and one stone won't be left upon another. Now, they thought that was all going to happen in their time, and indeed it was. It happened in 70 A.D., and he was speaking to them about 30 or 31 A.D. when he said that. A little later, three of them were with him up on the Mount of Olives, and they came to him, and they asked him, Well, tell us, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming? Now, they also understood that he was going to come back to earth again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to rule over the nations of the world. They did not understand that his second coming would not happen in their lifetime. They thought it would. They thought it was going to happen almost immediately, perhaps in two or three years of their lifetime. Jesus answered and said, he answered their first question first because that was going to happen in their lifetime. He said, take heed to yourselves that no man deceive you. He was talking to them as disciples that no man deceive you, he said, to his own disciples. For many shall come in my name, saying that I am the Christ, and shall deceive the many. They would come as the ministers of Christ, preaching that Jesus is the Christ, preaching Christ to the world, and they've been doing it for 1950 years. And yet he said they'd be deceiving the many. Now how could that be? How could people believe in Christ, accept Christ as their Savior, and still be lost? How could that happen? You know, Jesus said, in vain do they, speaking of many of them that are deceived, do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men, and making the law of God of no effect by your tradition, traditions and commandments of men instead of the commandments of God? In vain do they worship me. Jesus taught that. Not many of those who come in his name as his ministers will tell you that today, but your Bible does if you blow the dust off of it and look at it and see what the Bible says. You know, the greatest surprise that ever came to me in my life was 55 years ago. When I began to read in the Bible 
things that were just the exact opposite of what I had been taught in church all my life. I've been raised in a respectable church from babyhood on. And I found the Bible said just the opposite. In other words, I had been taught just the opposite of what the Bible says. And so have most of you, if you would ever open your Bibles and look for yourself and for yourself, see what it says and what it means. But very few have done that. Let's turn back now to Revelation, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 1. And I saw... It says here, John is recording what he saw in a vision. And he says, And I saw when the Lamb, which is Christ in this case, had opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, or living creatures, it can be translated, saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him, had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is not the coming of Christ, it's the coming of false ministers who went out posing as the ministers of Christ, but were deceiving the many. Now, verse 4, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another with the sword. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third base say, Come and see, and I beheld a black horse. Now here you have the black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Now here is famine. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. A scarcity of food, famine, if you will notice. And see that thou hurt not the oil or the wine. And that was famine. Now then, notice the next one, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice say, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and the grave followed him. In other words, pestilence following famine and disease and death. And those things were prophesied to come, and those are the four horsemen. Now, the first was a white horse, the second was a red horse, and the third was a black horse, and the fourth horseman was riding a pale horse. Now, Jesus explains all of that here in Matthew 24. He spoke of the white horse, the false prophets coming, claiming to be the representatives of Christ, the ministers of Jesus Christ, preaching Christ to the nations, saying, please accept Jesus Christ, begging people, accept Christ. Jesus didn't beg anyone to accept him. But nevertheless, they do today. And Jesus said, in vain are they worshiping him even, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Why are we having trouble in the world? It's the way we're living. Because we don't live according to God's way of life, God's law, which is a way of living. And people try to say that's all done away. We live the way we're living, and the way we're living is causing all of today's troubles. That's what's wrong in the world today. Now, if you notice verse 6 that is happening next here, Matthew 24. And... He said, what would come later, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So wars they began to have even then. And they had the war in 70 AD, and the temple was destroyed at that time. But that was not the end. But that and wars have continued. And they're going to continue on till the final climax, the grand smash 
final World War III, the nuclear war that will end at Armageddon. And that will be at the end and the time of the coming of Christ. Now next we come to the black horse, and you'll notice that in Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences. Now there will be famines, and that was the black horse, and then you find pestilences, the pale horse, and you find all of those are the four horsemen of Revelation. That's all explained and all to come up to our time. But that still was not the sign of Christ's coming. So his disciples had asked Jesus up on the Mount of Olives, what will these things be, that is the destruction of the temple, and the sign of thy coming? Now uh, he was explaining all of these things down to our present time. But he didn't come to the sign of his coming until a little later. Now let's go back to Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, many would come in his name deceiving and preaching a false gospel. But now he says, many will come in my name deceiving the people. But finally, this gospel of the kingdom, the same gospel he preached, would be proclaimed in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. It's the sign of his coming, just before his coming, at the time of the end. My friends, you're hearing that gospel now. You haven't been hearing the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, what was the gospel that Jesus preached? If you will notice in Mark, the first chapter, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It talks about John the Baptist preparing the way before him as he did before his first coming. Another was to prepare the way before his second coming. John the Baptist is described here and then Jesus being baptized by him in the river Jordan. And then verse 14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel. What gospel? What gospel did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom of God. That is the world rule of God, the kingdom of God, the government of God, a government that is going to rule over all nations and bring in the world tomorrow at the end of this world, a world of peace, a world of happiness, a world of great joy and accomplishment and well-being for everybody in it. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It was at hand because he had just overcome Satan the devil and qualified to sit on that throne which Satan the devil had been sitting on. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, therefore, that is, change the way you believe and change the way you are living. It's the way people have been living that's been causing all of our troubles. And believe the gospel. The gospel was the kingdom of God. But they didn't believe the gospel very long because a short time later, within 21 or 22 years, as Paul, the apostle Paul, wrote to the people in Galatia, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They had proclaimed another gospel. Now the false preachers that were coming that Jesus had told them about, and they've come, they came in, in the time of the early disciples. They came by 53 AD or before that time. They had already turned to a different gospel in 53 AD time, as Paul explained in the prophecy that I just read to you. But in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and beginning with verse 13, speaking of these false apostles with another gospel, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And they themselves are deceived, because the whole world is deceived. Many of them are honest and believe they have the truth, but they have been deceived themselves. And no marvel 
for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. And therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, Satan's ministers, professing to be the ministers of God, but Satan's ministers also are transformed as the ministers of righteousness. And so we shouldn't be shocked because that kind of thing has happened. And it certainly has, and the whole world has been deceived, and the world has been drugged with false ideas of religion, with a false gospel. And the whole gospel is in your Bible if you just open it up, blow the dust off of it, read it, and open up your mind with an open mind and not a closed mind of prejudice. We go back to Matthew 24 once again. And here we find the very next thing to happen comes in verse 21. And there shall be after the gospel of the kingdom is finally preached to the world as it is now and you're hearing it on this very program and it's being fulfilled before your eyes and in your ears this very second and there shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this same time known or ever shall be now I just read the same thing in Daniel at the time of the end and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. A time when all humanity could be destroyed. That had to be a time after the hydrogen bomb had been discovered and produced. It never could have happened before. And it had to be at a time when the gospel of the kingdom was going out again and it began in January of 1934. And then it went into all Europe in January of 1953, 19 years later. And that's 100 time cycles after they had turned to a false gospel. And then after that, immediately after the tribulation in verse 29 of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now then, I want to go back once again and read to you Revelation, the sixth chapter. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heavens fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And they shall see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory to set up the kingdom of God and to rule all nations and bring in the happy and the peaceful world tomorrow. But we'll have to repent. We'll have to live according to the laws of God. The laws of God are the way God himself lives and the way Christ lives and the way Christ did live when he was here on this earth. My friends, you need to know about these things. And this truth has been hidden entirely too long, and God's time has come. Now, I mentioned this book, but are we in the time of the end? You should get it. Are we living in the last days? That is one booklet. Another book that I'd like to have you get, now I'm going to mention some of these, and they're free, and there's no charge, and no follow-up or request for money. The book of Revelation unveiled at last, explaining the book of Revelation, which you have never understood. Then another one. And the most important of all, the United States and Britain in prophecy. You can't understand prophecy until you understand this. The United States and the British people in prophecy. 
and all you do is just send your name and address to me, Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California. That's all the address you need. Just Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California, 91123. Or better yet, go to the telephone right now. All right, friends, I'm supposed to cut I'm supposed to cut out of there. Whoop. I'm supposed to cut out of there before I'm supposed to cut out of there before the, he gives the uh, address and phone number and we're going to go to another uh, another video with Mr. Armstrong anyway. Uh, you know, we went through United States and British Commonwealth in prophecy in a series several months ago here on Sabbath.tv on COGTV.org. Well, that's in our archive at COGTV.org. If you go to the, uh, let's see, is it library page? No, you go to the archive page, the archive video page, and you can find where we streamed, I read, and we put scrolling text with it as, uh, as I went through through all of the chapters of the United States and British Commonwealth and Prophecy, which you just heard Mr. Armstrong say, that of all the books he just offered, to him that was the most important to understand. <clears throat> and since we've gone through that, and he, in the last several telecasts, we, the two we played last night, this one this morning, probably the next one that I'm about to play in a couple of minutes, he'll probably offer the book of Revelation unveiled at last uh, again in, that, <clears throat> in the next telecast as well as he did in both telecasts last night and here this morning. So at some point, we'll probably read through and scroll the text with the book of Revelation unveiled uh, and make sure we have a very thorough understanding. But even this telecast that was just aired, Mr. Armstrong covered a lot of stuff. And there's one thing I hope that you uh, picked up, brethren, that he, of the many comments he made and scriptures that he made reference to, he made reference in Matthew 24 to verse 22 where he said, except Christ intervened when he does, all flesh would be wiped off the face of this earth. <clears throat> and you know, uh, that's uh, of the many things that uh, Mr. Armstrong would pound that lectern about while he was still alive in, in the, the mid-80s when he was saying, brethren, half of you and 90% of you aren't getting it. One of the things that after I prayed and fasted and asked God, God, what is it we're not getting? And Mr. Armstrong keeps pounding the lectern about and saying, brethren, you're not getting it, <clears throat> was the fact that things like this are, are indeed coming. <clears throat> and I think Mr. Armstrong felt that a lot of us were just, well, hey, we were happy in the church. We had a vibrant church. We had wonderful, loving brethren, many of them. You know, uh, we were not all divided and split up. We were huge congregations with loving people and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, not to say there's not some loving people out there now, but we're, we're not all together in one big group and, you know, big happy family. It can, can be real nice. And so, and one of the things Mr. Armstrong would complain about often that he wished we would change, and that is when people came into to fellowship, uh, well, when they came to services, he said several times, he wished, brethren, when you came into services, before service starts, that you would come in with a reverent attitude, looking forward to hearing God's messenger speak, and showing your reverence to our Creator, to the Father and His Son, you know, our husband-to-be, and reverencing, um, the, you know, going back to the creation, remember our Creator. And so he was hoping we would sit down in our seats with a prayerful attitude, even praying before services in a prayerful attitude, and open up our Bibles, maybe read a few things there, and save the, the yak, 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 yak fellowship until after service. It's what he hoped for, but he would... Uh, he didn't mention that a whole lot, you know, and some people responded to it, and a lot, a lot of people did not. But <clears throat> he was hoping we would get the sobriety of what God is about to do. And, unless, and what's coming up with when the fifth seal 
opens up and commences. That begins the great tribulation that Christ described as, uh, you know, before I take this verse off, let me read it. I just paraphrased it when I was saying it to you. Let's read the verse, verse 22, Matthew 24. I'll read a couple of verses, then we're going to go to his next telecast where Christ said in this verse, and except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, those called to the spring harvest, accounted worthy to escape, accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man in the first resurrection, those days will be cut short, will be shortened. Let's back up a verse, because he's saying, except those days should be shortened. Let's see what's in verse 21. He's saying, for then, those days he's talking about, shall be great tribulation and uh, uh, you know the original words in the greek mean mega trouble the king james translators rendered this in a term that's caught on and we all you know the way it's caught on it has a special meaning to us when we say great tribulation it it means more than just mega trouble much trouble you know it, it means this time of the fifth seal great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time coming up no nor ever after nothing before it nothing after it. it's going to be as bad as what's coming that makes it the same as what jeremiah called the time of jacob's trouble a time of trouble that nothing before or after it was ever as bad either so it's the time for the descendants of Jacob, especially the birthright sons of Joseph, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States, we're going to get the biggest impact of this worst time of trouble with our cities laid waste at the beginning of World War III, Ezekiel 6, 6. For then shall be great tribulation. And so Christ said in this next verse, um, and except that great tribulation be cut short, there should no flesh be saved alive. So you know, very significant, and just in front of us. A life as we know it today and the jobs we have, the fun we have, not going to be the same at all. Beast is going to require people to work on the Sabbath, and unless you are accounted worthy to escape the beast to the one place on the face of the earth that to which God promises protection from the beast, the only place on the earth that the beast has no reach into, no power over, and that's the place described in, you might, you might have put it up on the screen for you real quick. If you have your Bibles, you could open it up yourself to Daniel chapter 11. And then you go over to verse 41, 40, 41. But here, I'll, I'll pop it up on the screen for you since I got this goodie here where I can do that. And uh, let's see, do we have it? Let me pull this forward. Yeah, and here's Daniel in chapter 11, verse 41, saying that he, the, the king of the north, the beast, shall enter, you know, the, the, the one who revives the Holy Roman Empire at the, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. He shall enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. That's the only area, it's a tri-regional area in the Middle East, it's just east of the Jordan River, just east of where the modern-day state, uh, nation-state of Israel is located, just east of there, through the mountain way. Big range from Edom in the south, the entrance to which is Petra in the mountain range, and you get on into Edom, go continue north to Moab, and on up to Amman, which is still today called Amman. It's the capital of Jordan. All of that's going to be a protected wilderness area that this verse describes the only place the Bible mentions that escape the hand of the beast. And it's a wilderness. And God promises in Revelation 12, 14, he promises to take those who are accounted worthy uh, on the wings of a two eagle and then either there or elsewhere. Let me pop that verse up real quick. I'm, if you've got your own Bible, we're going to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14. And there, you can see here, I'll pop it on the screen. You can see God says, through the apostle John writing from the Isle of Patmos in 90 AD, and to the woman, and in prophecy, woman is the church. And that can either be the true church 
or it can be the false church. But in this case, at this point, in Revelation 12, it's referring to the true church and to the woman. The true church were given two wings of a great eagle, but not everybody in the true church. There are some who are in the true church, in the body of Christ. Let me come back to you for a second. I'll I'll pull that forward again in just a second. There are some who are part of the body of Christ, who are in the church, who will not be accounted worthy to escape. And the rest of Revelation 12 even says they keep the commandments of God and the testimonies of God. I'll I'll scroll ahead to that verse in a moment, but let's finish. Let's finish what's here in this verse. To the true church, where those to the portion of the true church who are counted worthy to escape are given two wings of a great eagle. I'll show you in a moment in the rest of this chapter how there is a remnant, a portion who's part of the true church who who don't get these two wings of a great eagle, but those who are counted worthy do that that she might fly into the wilderness. So it's right here in this verse where it tells us those who are accounted worthy to escape go via two wings of a great eagle, a symbol, or either a chariot of fire or a modern-day jet aircraft engine. Or if God chose to just do it literally, you know, there have been big eagles picked up little kids and animals and if he's making a great eagle, like he made a great fish for Job, oh, I'm sorry, for Jonah, uh, that swallowed up Jonah, and Jonah lived inside, or, well, you know, he was inside of it, maybe dead for three days, and then resurrected. But God can make a great eagle that could fly, a claw, you know, with big claws that could fly some of us. <laughs> you know, uh, might be a rough trip, but uh, just for the fun of it all, I wouldn't mind going that way. Oh, boy. You know, you speak, and sometimes God may take note of it and say, Okay, Gilbreth, if you are accounted worthy at the time I'm, you know, doing this, <laughs> I might reserve a great eagle for you while I put the rest of everybody on comfortable modern jet aircraft. Or maybe it'll be some old World War aircraft. You know, but it'll be whatever a symbol for two wings of a great eagle could be that God has that option. He has plenty of options to fly those who are accounted worthy of the woman, of the true woman, of the true church. Those accounted worthy. He has plenty of options for flying them into the wilderness. Probably that area that is mentioned in the verse I just showed you from Daniel 11, verse 41 into her place where she is nourished, meaning God will feed those accounted worthy to escape for a time and times and half a time, one, two, three and a half, three and a half years from the face of the serpent. And let's go forward to uh, the next few verses just to show you what, how the devil tries to foil this two wings of an eagle operation after they're flown into the wilderness dropped off probably on the west side of the Jordan because we're going to be fleeing from an army and that army is probably you know they are they're already the beast will already have armies surrounding Jerusalem so wherever God flies those who are counted worthy to escape we're going to get the attention of the beast and the one who's influencing, leading, powering, empowering the beast. You know, you see a lot of software say it's powered by so so and so. Well, the beast is powered by the devil, and the, it says the devil himself. Uh, you know, serpent is another name for the devil, as you you see explained in the Bible itself in verse nine of Revelation twelve. Uh, how far away am I? Well, you've all seen that, but all right, since I mentioned it, let me back up to verse 9, and we'll just make that point very, very clear. Here in verse 9, it says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. All right, so there, anytime that old serpent in the Bible is the devil and Satan. So, all right, let's go pop back ahead to verse 15, still in this same chapter 12. And see what happens after those accounted worthy to escape are flown into 
the Middle East, probably into some place in Israel, probably not, maybe not far from Jerusalem, which is going to get the attention of the beast who has an army surrounding Jerusalem, and the devil is going to send that army after those who are accounted worthy to escape. Take a look right here, verse 15, Revelation 12. And the serpent, that old, that old, you know, the devil and Satan, cast out of his mouth water as a flood. This is a biblical expression for an army. I mean, that explains itself in many scriptures, especially throughout the Old Testament. Uh, armies are talked about as water or as a flood. After the woman. So the devil sends an army after the woman, after the true church, after those accounted worthy to escape. He's going to send that army after everybody, you know, he's going to come after everybody else later because God's going to eat up his army after Satan sends this army after after those accounted worthy to escape, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, that he, that he you know, that he might take the people accounted worthy to escape captive, to be carried away of the flood, of the army that, that the devil sends. And then the very next verse, verse 16, and the earth helped the woman. So God opens up the earth, and the earth opened her mouth. He probably opens up a big earthquake and swallowed up the flood, the army, which the dragon had cast out of his mouth, which the devil had sent. And then, now we're going to go to the very next verse, verse 17, that talks about what happens after God foiled Satan by destroying his army that he sends after the true church after the portion of the true church that who are accounted worthy to escape they get on into this place of nourishment protection safety final training but those who were not accounted worthy who are left behind they're called in the bible the remnant and the devil who is very wroth at this point goes after the remnant let's take a look at it in this verse the next verse 17 says and the dragon that's you know, as de- described in verse 9, that's the devil, that's Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant of the seed of the woman of the true church are those who were not accounted worthy to escape. That's the remnant that's being referred to here in this verse. And it, it even describes the remnant are the people are brethren who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, some of you may be scratching your head and saying, well, if they keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, wouldn't they have been accounted worthy to escape then? That's not enough. You know, God says we have to live Luke 4, 4, Matthew 4, 4 by every word of God. And in Luke 21, verse 36, Christ, in his own words, while he was here in the flesh, said, there are two prerequisites to be accounted worthy. Beside keeping all of the rest of God's commands and Christ's testimonies, you have to do what he said in verse 36, where he said, therefore, because of verse 35, saying the great tribulation comes as a snare upon the whole world, catches everybody off guard on all of them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth, as verse 35 says it, or as you could say it, shorter like the French do, tout le monde, everybody in the world caught off guard. It's going to come unexpectedly at a time that's unexpected, especially if you're not watching. Even if you're watching, it could come any moment now. But we go to bed and get up in the morning, it hasn't come. Another day is, you know, it could come again because things are happening where it looks like these first four seals are, are blooming and about to blossom fully. And Yet it still doesn't happen. So you got to keep watching and you'll know that it could happen any moment and you stay sober and awake and continue to watch. And one more thing Christ did do in verse 36 was watch and pray always. And he said, do these because this thing comes like a snare. But if you're watching and praying, he holds out a carrot, a promise saying in the rest of verse 36, so that you may be accounted worthy to do two things. One, at the end of the verse, he says, stand before the Son of Man, meaning in the first resurrection, you know, for those in the spring harvest. And the second thing that precedes and is ahead of this in the verse even too, in time order, is that you may be accounted worthy to escape this great tribulation that he was talking about in the previous verse 35, 
that comes like a snare unexpectedly upon the whole world, all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. And so he said, watch and pray always so that you can be accounted worthy to escape and be in the first resurrection. So those left behind are not even accounted worthy to be in the first resurrection, even though they have kept the commandments of God and the testimonies of Christ. Now, wait a minute, Stephen, that's a pretty big penalty. Well, God does offer a way out. You go to Revelation 3, verse 18, and Christ says, "If you it, to those who are left behind, in Revelation 3, between verses 14 and 22, God is addressing the Laodicean era, which commences as verse 18 helps support and prove the words and doctrine of God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong, where he said the Laodicean era commences after the Great Tribulation has commenced, after the brethren of the Philadelphia era that we've just been talking about in the earlier part of Revelation 12, part of the woman who was accounted worthy to escape is taken to her place of nourishment, protection, safety, final training. After that, then the Laodicean era begins. Oh, yeah, but Mr. Armstrong, who said that, Stephen, he died. Well, so did the apostles Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Bartholomew, Peter, Paul, you name it. These guys died. So what are you going to do, rip these pages out of the Bible? You know, uh, God spoke through Mr. Armstrong, through inspiration, even to the point of wanting us to have a sense of urgency. And just like when God had Jonah tell Nineveh that he was going to destroy them, even without speaking it, God left himself the option to change his mind and say, okay, you guys have put on sackcloth and ashes, repented, did far more than I expected you might do. Although Jonah kind of suspected you might do that, and he didn't want to tell you because he didn't want you to repent. He wanted to see you. He wanted to see me destroy you. He wanted to see you destroyed. But I'm a loving, merciful God, and even though I wanted to wrap this up years ago and inspired my servant to tell you it was going to end within a certain number of years, I reserved to myself the option to change my mind. And so. Even though my apostle said well, it would happen by a certain change of century, um, change of millennia, even the way that worked out. But uh, if I had done that, a lot of you people would have died in the lake of fire because <laughs> I've called you. You weren't like Mr. Armstrong pounding the desk. Half of you, brethren, 90% of you aren't getting it. You weren't getting it. You weren't repenting. You didn't show a sober, awake attitude. You were not watching and praying like Christ told you and my son Christ told you in Luke 21, verse 36. I couldn't account you worthy to either escape or be in the first resurrection. And a lot of you were in such weak condition, you would not have stood up to the beast in the great tribulation. You would have caved in and taken the mark of the beast, had my punishments poured out on you during the seventh day, year-long day of the Lord, and then be burned up in the lake of fire. A merciful, loving God, I don't care what Bill Pickle out there says in his blog, has extended the time for us out of his love and mercy, even to the point of risking his end-time apostles' words that if God wanted to wrap it up by a certain time, he did want to wrap it up then. But because of us, brethren, and his mercy for us, he had to make, as if it were, his apostle, you know, inaccurate on that one point, except by understanding the urgency, even in the fact that the early apostles thought Christ would return in their time. And believe you me, the Father wants to have Christ return. He'd like to see all this evil and mess wrapped up, too. But... 2 Peter 3, verse 9, he says, it's his will that none perish. And for the spring harvest who've been called now, if we don't show a certain amount of qualification and repentance, we're going to burn. And he doesn't want us to burn. He doesn't want us to perish. Now, I say burn, I mean burn up and perish. But he doesn't want that. He started life in us, in us and he wants to finish it. So, And to him, like verse 
excuse me, verse 8 of 2 Peter 3 says, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a, as a day with God. A decade, two decades, three decades longer than he originally wanted to wrap this up. Not a big deal with God. You know, and uh, some of you that write these blogs and love to say, uh, hey, look at 1975 in prophecy. That didn't come true. You are not, you guys didn't listen God's apostle explained in 1970, five years before 1975, that Christ wouldn't be returning in that year. He said, because so many ministers and so many people, brethren even misinterpreted what he said in the book, the booklet, 1975 in Prophecy, and some ministers did too, and then Herman Hay gets on the bandwagon with his uh, uh, compendium explaining how, wow, things are leading toward where it'll wrap up in 75, and of course later he changes that and all. But even Herman Hay misinterpreted what Mr. Armstrong was saying in the booklet. Mr. Armstrong did let that go by for a little bit, and then some came up with these little cute expressions. One college instructor would say, 72, and we're through. And a lot of students trained to be caught in the field ministry heard that college instructor say that. And as they went out into the field ministry and their sermons, they would take that catch, catchphrase and repeat it in the churches. Oh, it sounded cool. Oh, 72 and we're through. You know, and he was the student who heard an instructor say that was the cool guy because he's there saying this cool expression, 72 and we're through. Well, Mr. Armstrong in 1971 put that down and said, look, those saying that, you know, you, you've misinterpreted my booklet. And because so many of you are saying Christ is returning in 75, that'll be the last year ever possible for the return of Christ because God just won't do it because of the verse in which God said, no man knows the, uh, well, I almost need to turn to that verse now. No man knows the... Uh, the day or the hour. And so Mr. Armstrong was saying that five years before 1975, and yet people still continued to to say as if Mr. Armstrong were teaching and were disappointed after 75. No, five years before it, he was saying, that will not be the time Christ returns. So any misunderstanding on that should have been cleaned up five years before 75 from Mr. Armstrong's mouth himself. I heard it with my own ears as I was a student in Pasadena that year when Mr. Armstrong was said that not once but several times trying to help people see, look, don't be going out there preaching that my booklet 1975 in prophecy means I'm saying Christ is returning that year. No, that just means scientists who predicted all these marvelous wonders for 1975 are going to see the seals uh, of evil happening instead. At this, and uh, he was showing a paradox. Even though we may have a lot of fancy dancy stuff that's come along, and look what's happened since the internet's come along, and all the interventions related to that, and cell phones, and Bluetooth little devices, and uh, you know, we could sit here and rattle off all kind of fancy inventions that have happened even since Mr. Armstrong has died but some that had already come along by 1975. And yet the paradox that Mr. Armstrong was trying to point out was at the same time we have all these fancy dancy inventions and man going to the moon and back safely, uh, we have evil on the world, growing evil. And so, uh, and that growing evil is part of the signs of those seals of Revelation that tell us that fifth seal is about to boom off. And Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22, tell us that when that great tribulation comes, those not accounted worthy to escape it, here's how you can still make it into the kingdom. Because you were, as this verse says, you were keeping the commandments of God. Notice the end of this verse. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but whoa, wow, uh, uh, booby wappa, I got left behind. Uh, my knees are knocking now. Hey, 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 I didn't expect this. I thought I was rich and increased with goods and that I was going to be accounted worthy to, to go, go. But here I am. Well, Christ says, if you do this, Revelation 3, verse 18, for those of you left behind, the four, four verses before verse 18 tells you the condition of the Laodicean church. You thought you were rich 
and big hot shots, but no, you were poor, blind, miserable, and naked, spiritually speaking. And the four verses after verse 18, verse 18, right in the center of the nine verses that talk to the Laodicean church, those four verses encourage those left behind that you can be at the marriage supper if you do what Christ says in verse 18. I'll tell you, we'll, we'll read that in a moment. He says you can be at the marriage supper, which means you can be in the first resurrection. Only the first resurrection marries Jesus Christ. So you can be part of that, uh, that spring harvest that marries Christ, that's transformed in the spirit and to the God family in the first resurrection if you are left behind and do what Christ said do in Revelation 3.18. You have to buy your way out of this miserable condition where you thought you were rich and spiritually a hot shot. And so and there's even one minister who says, well, it didn't work while Mr. Armstrong was alive, so we don't have to do Luke 21.36. It didn't work while he was alive, so don't waste your time watching and praying always. I mean, too much work, too much effort. You don't have to do that. It didn't work while Mr. Armstrong was alive. This one minister says, Richard, you should be ashamed of yourself. In fact, I'd hate to be in your shoes when you have to stand before Jesus Christ and answer how you blasphemed his words, where Christ's own words, it's not Mr. Armstrong's words, although Mr. Armstrong would encourage us to do what Christ said in Luke 21, 36. I'll pop that scripture up on the screen in a moment before we go to the next telecast. I know I said it'd be a few minutes. Well, it's, it's been a few minutes. <laughs> and then some, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> But, brethren, I hope this is encouraging to you and will warm you up to wanting to listen uh, wholeheartedly to this next video we're going to play from a World Tomorrow telecast with Mr. Armstrong on this same subject of the symbols and beast of Revelation, helping our, uh, us with having the knowledge and information and Mr. Armstrong's words to help our understanding that this is really going to come. It is really going to happen. And we need to be awake and sober and watchful and ready for this. And uh, so that's the whole purpose of these couple of telecasts this morning, plus to, <clears throat> to uh, let my head clear up from a head cold from last night, my voice be able to be cleared to read through the entire chapter 7 that I hope to do later today yet. Hope it, I'm very thankful that the storm that was forecast to come in, I did, John, I got the... I sprayed the rubberized flex up on the parts of my roof where I did a, a water hose test yesterday and found out the leak spots where you know some of the leak spots were, and I rubber flexed that area so so that the storm coming this weekend hopefully wouldn't do what it did to me Tuesday night and have rain pouring down on my face and the rest of my bed uh, in the night. I put a tarp over that and moved over to the wall where the rain wasn't coming down. But it did make, wake me up sick, and I got a little, I was up late because of the Bible study last night, and I woke up with a little bit of, of a re, uh, head cold coming back on me, just a little bit. But I'm going to drink, after we're off today, I'm going to go drink some chicken broth, hope to come back later this afternoon and read chapter 7. But let me finish these verses, and then we'll go to the second telecast by Mr. Armstrong that I hope you are very excited to want to hear, because... Brethren, as Mr. Armstrong said, half of you, 90% of you aren't getting it. You weren't, he was sad that he saw people just in a gay fellowshipping mood. I don't mean gay sexually, I mean gay happy, the way the, a word originally was intended to mean, you know, people coming happy, 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 and not at all sober about the fact that God would like to wrap this up and could wrap it up any moment if Everybody's doing what he said in Luke 21, 36, watching and praying always, because that's the condition for escaping. And he does want some people escaped. He wants at least 144,000 in the place of nourishment, protection, final training, because the ceiling of the 144,000 comes in between. Let me turn on a monitor. I want to I put a, oh, I can't put it up on the screen, can I? Let me see. Yes, I could. See, I got, I could, I got it on this screen over here. All right, I didn't mean to leave that 
color bars up. But I, in between, this chart over here shows the position, the place in time order where where the ceiling of the 144,000 comes. We'll come back and finish these verses in just a second. But the ceiling of the 144,000 occurs, if you can see this, let me, let me bring this in closer for a moment. The ceiling of the 144,000 comes in between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. So after two and a half years of the Great Tribulation, then we have the marker, the astro signs and the, the, the heavenly signs and the sun, the moon, the stars tell us that we're, we're at the two and a half year mark into the Great Tribulation. And we're just before the last year of that three and a half years where God will open up the seventh seal for the year long day of the Lord with its seven trumpets. The first four winds, the four trumpets, the last three trumpets being the three great woes, woe, 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 and Christ returning on that third woe at the seventh trump, and those who are counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man are then raised from their graves, and those who remain alive are transformed and meet Christ in the air on that seventh trump, and then the third woe is poured out, the last seven plagues. GTA had that wrong. It doesn't, those plagues are poured out after Christ returns, not before. Um, according to, to the Bible and the way Mr. Armstrong taught us. But uh, um, the sealing of the 144,000 occurs after the, heaven, after the heavenly sign in the sun, moon, stars. And uh, let me bring, see, am I able to bring that full forward? That is on screen two right here. Yeah, I can go ahead and bring that full forward. Maybe you can see it a little better. The sealing of the 144,000 4,000 comes in time order right after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal commences. There's a not only a lap, a little lapse for the sealing of the 144,000, but before God commences the seventh seal, after the sixth seal has been fulfilled, God has a, uh, he has a, 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 what's that you do with your kids when you tell them time out? He does a time out. He does a half hour of silence in the heavens before the first of this the before the first trumpet of the seventh seal is opened he does a half hour of silence and that half hour of silence comes after the sealing of the 144,000 so there's some transitional things that happen in between the sixth seal and that seventh seal so i hope that's helpful to you brethren but let's go back over here now to uh over here, well, where'd he go? Where we have the uh, the scripture on the screen I was reading. Let's put that up and see where we were. All right, I was telling you from Revelation 3. I, I'm going to read you 3 verse 18 in just a moment. Let me finish Revelation 12. And the dragon was wroth with the woman uh, and went to make war with the remnant. Since he couldn't get those who were accounted worthy to escape, God swallowed up his army in a big in a in a big hole in the earth, a big earthquake, and a, 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 you see it in the news a lot later lately, where there's been a lot of just openings up of the ground, and the ground opens up a big hole. Christ, God says He'll do that. Uh, in the previous verse, He says He'll do that to that flood, that army that the Satan sent after Him. The earth opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood, the army which the devil had sent after the. Those are kind of worthy to escape. So now he's wroth and he goes after the remnant, those that are left behind, not accounted worthy to escape. And yet they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. But as I was saying and explaining, they don't do what's in Luke 21, 36. They were not watching the four seals that are active and praying about the people affected by the daily events of the four seals, causing them to suffer from false religion, causing them to suffer from, uh, from uh, that's the first seal, causing them to suffer from uh, the second seal of war and rumors of war and all that hurts families and people die and lose their love and people lose their loved ones. And the third seal, the scarcity of food and famine, the black horse, the third seal, and the fourth seal, the pale horse, uh, with a rider named death, causing death by all kinds of things disease epidemic, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt, 
causing death by seismic, seismic activity, commotions in the air, gale force winds of all kinds, typhoons, hurricanes. Um, um, what's the other kind of gale, major gale force wind? You got tornadoes, hurricanes, typhoons, and you got commotions on the ground. You got the earthquakes. That's the only thing the King James Version mentioned, but the word Christ used was seismus. You look it up in a good Greek, Greek English lexicon, it means more than earthquakes. It means commotions in the air, the gale force winds I mentioned, and commotions on the ground, the earthquakes, of course, and volcanic eruptions, uh, tsunamis, wildfires, floods, anything of a seismic nature in the air or on the ground. And also, a third thing for the fourth seal with the horse, with the rider named Death, only mentioned in Mark 13, verse 8, by Christ, Tarake, meaning roiling waters, mobs, seditions, general trouble that leads up to the mega trouble, but not the fifth seal, great tribulation trouble. Um, but Christ said, watch those four that are active now and pray always about them so you'll be accounted worthy to escape this fifth seal, great tribulation and, and be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. All right, now, before we go on to Revelation 3, there's another verse. Oh, yeah, is that, uh, let me see. Did we finish all of Revelation 12? Yep, we did. Okay, so let's go on. Let's go over to Revelation 3. If you got your Bible open, we're going to stay in Revelation. We're just going to go to chapter 3. I'm going to pop up verse 18, just so you can see what those who are left behind have to do in order to make it into the first resurrection, that's their only option. They're not going to, they missed being accounted worthy to escape already. But there's a second thing you can be accounted worthy for that they missed that they can do a makeup test for. And God gives you what the requirements of the makeup test are right here in verse 18 of Revelation 3, where Christ said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And as God's end time apostle is explained, and it makes sense according to Scripture, that means the fiery trial of martyrdom. I counsel you to buy of me that fiery trial of martyrdom. You'll see from the rest of the verse how that fits. That you may be rich and have white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness, the four verses before this explain the condition of Laodicean is that they're poor, blind, naked. Let's see if I can back up. A verse. You say you're rich and increased with goods, verse 17 of Revelation 3, and you don't know, you know not that you're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked spiritually. And so he says, you got left behind because of that. I counsel you to buy your way out through martyrdom, that you may be clothed in the shame of your nakedness, not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. And then the rest of Revelation 3 to the end of the chapter at verse 22, Christ explains that if you will endure to the end and not compromise now as you did, you compromised on me on Luke 21, 36, you wouldn't do it. But now when the beast says, bow down to my image, and when he says, work on the Sabbath, and he says, if you refuse to do either one of those, I'll put you to death. Well, the beast just gave you what you need. The beast just offered you a way to buy your way into the kingdom, to do what Christ said here in verse 18. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. The beast is offering you the martyrdom, as long as you don't do what the rest of verse 3 says in that, uh, of Revelation 3 says in verses 19 through 22, as long as you don't compromise, as long as when the beast says, work on the Sabbath, you totally refuse. You don't even work five minutes. Well, I'll work for an hour and satisfy the beast, and then I'll sneak off and keep the Sabbath, and he'll never know because he saw me work. You just blew it. You just took the mark of the beast. It doesn't matter if you try to keep the Sabbath the rest of the day. You worked an hour. You worked five minutes even, or a minute. As far as the beast is concerned, you were trying to compromise to him. You didn't endure to the end. You compromised. You bought the mark of the beast. You bought... You bought your way into living into at least a portion of the seventh seal, the year-long great day of the Lord where God pours out his wrath on those who took the mark of the beast. And then the end of that is you wind up in the lake of fire. But Christ says, if you will 
in the four verses between 19 and 22, he encourages those left behind. If you will endure, even though it's going to mean, as the beast will say to you, if you don't work on the Sabbath, if you don't bow down before my image, off with your head, burn at the stake, split in half, however they kill you. You know, he just offered you a way to buy the martyrdom that gets you into the kingdom now because you are one who keeps the commandments and the testimonies of Christ. And you've got to keep the commandments including the Sabbath, even when the beast says, by doing so, they're going to kill you and martyr you. You make you a martyr and enable you to do what Christ said in verse 18 of Revelation 3, if you're left behind. But you don't have to go that way. Uh, in fact, I encourage people to go what do what Christ said, as Mr. Armstrong encouraged people to do, do what Christ said in Luke 21, verse 36. Watch and pray always. With the therefore referring back to 35, saying, look, this thing comes like, unexpectedly on the whole world. Therefore, watch and pray always, so that, even though you might not have expected it to come right when it does, at least you were in condition to be accounted worthy to escape. You can watch for the two wings of a great eagle, and whoosh, be off into the Middle East, ready to run from the army the devil sends after you, that then I'll protect you from, and open up the earth, and swallow up that army of the devil. And you'll spend three and a half times, three and a half years, a time, times and a half a time, in a place in the wilderness between Edom with the entranceway at Petra to Amman, all of that area protected from the beast. We're not just confined to little old rock mountain Petra. All that area is protected from the beast. And obey your leaders who God will appoint for you Sabbath to Sabbath over there, and you'll find you may be able to explore all the way up to Amman. Just don't go past that because... You know, that's your protected boundary in that protected area. But uh, so what else is in the rest of those verses, Revelation 3? Read them for yourself just in case you think you might be left behind or in case you might want to encourage somebody who not doing what they should do, saying, look what you got to do to get in the kingdom. If you don't do pressure cooker, Luke 21, 36, now watch and pray always. Um, you know, you, you got to endure the beast saying your life if you refuse to work on the Sabbath or bow down before his image. But with Christ saying, I'll come to you and knock on your door then, just like the Father sent to me a couple of angels the night before my crucifixion when I was sweating as if it were blood and my knees knocking too, and I tried to get the disciples up and pray with me. I, I couldn't even rouse them up. Just, yeah, yeah, oh, he wants to pray, okay. <laughs> they, 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 they were in the condition that mis caused, that was like what Mr. Armstrong was complaining about when he pounded on the lectern about us, saying, brethren, half of you, 90% of you aren't getting it. The disciples, even the night before Christ's crucifixion, were not getting it. They didn't get it that Christ was about to be beaten to, to pieces and then strung up, nailed up on a stake, that the world calls a cross. And there's a lot of talk about that. But Christ was crucified in a most horrifying, horrible way. And he knew it. And he was sweating as if it were blood and great anticipation, anxiety even of it, which Christ understands anxiety. Believe you me, he had a lot of it the night before his crucifixion. And come on, guys, pray with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Not then they didn't get it. They got it later. They even had to suffer some of that themselves later, except for the Apostle John. But uh, Christ will come knowing what it's like to be facing martyrdom. The anxiety you may be going through. And he says in the verses 19 through 22, I'll knock on your door I'll come and I'll encourage you the way the Father sent angels to encourage me. And he's saying to you at that time, it explains what he's going to be saying to you. Endure to the end. He's not coming saying, I'm going to let you off the hook. He's already told you, verse 18, if you want in the kingdom, you've got to buy of him gold tried in the fire. You've got to go through this martyrdom if you got left behind. If you get left behind. Don't get left behind, brother. Brethren, do Luke 21, 36. Mr. Armstrong in the next telecast is going to help us understand what to do. I promised you, I told you I would read Revelation 3, verse 18, or that I'd put it up on the screen, so let me keep my word. I did that. It's right here on the screen now. I'm sorry. Uh, 
Let's just look at it one more time. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and have white raiment, you may be clothed. Let's take a look at the verses that follow. Here Christ is saying, And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent of that lukewarmness, that compromising you had. Even though you were keeping the commandments of God, you were compromising. You didn't do Luke 21, 36. So repent of that lukewarm, not-do-it-all thing. And here he says, okay, now you're facing the beast. You, you told him you weren't going to work on the Sabbath. You told him you weren't going to bow down before the image of the beast. And he says, okay, tomorrow we're putting you we're on the stake and burning you in fire. And God and Christ says, well, look, I stand at your door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come to him and we'll sup with him and he with me. You'll be at the marriage supper if, look at the next verse, to him that if you overcome, if you in, endure to the end, uh, you know, you stick with it through the being killed. I'll grant to sit with me in my throne even as I overcame. He stayed with the crucifixion and am sat down with my father in his throne. And the last verse of that says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches of the seven church eras of Revelation 2 and 3. All right, did I cover the verses I said I would cover? Or maybe I should just pop Luke 21, 36 on the screen real quick. Then we'll go to Mr. Armstrong. I think, I think, I think that's the only verses I've made reference to. I didn't pop up on the screen, I hope. You got a Bible there, you know, you can look them up. If I missed one, just be a little forgiving. Sometimes I goof up. Not intentionally, but, you know, not to any, hopefully, any major harm. But Luke 21, 36 says... Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I punched that up backward. Instead of Luke 21, I got Luke 12. I meant to go for Luke 21. All right, maybe that'll help you remember if you want to look it up yourself. It is Luke 21, a parallel chapter to Mark 13 and Matthew 24. Luke 21, verse 36. All right, this here. This is the verse we want here where Christ said, watch you. Let me just back up. The therefore, just like I mentioned to you, the therefore it says, for as a snare, very unexpectedly, shall it, he's just been describing the great tribulation, shall the great tribulation come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, toot le monde, everybody in the world. It comes unexpectedly on everyone. And because it comes like a snare, unexpectedly, he then says, therefore, watch you and pray always. And by doing these two prerequisites, that you may be accounted worthy to Two things, escape all these things that shall come to pass. Only the first four seals are active. He's saying that you can escape the fifth seal, great tribulation, and the seventh seal, wrath of the Lord and the year-long day of the Lord, and stand before this, so that you also may be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. So if you're watching and praying always and doing the other commandments of God and testimonies of Christ, you'll be accounted worthy to, to be in the first resurrection and to even escape ahead of that escape the great tribulation that's coming. That's a pretty nice little bargain and deal God makes for us there. All right, brethren, we have just enough time to go to Mr. Armstrong for one more telecast that he explains more about Daniel and Revelation, and he does it with understanding that hopefully you'll hear in between the lines and you grab into the understanding, too, that the sobriety we need, that this really is going to happen, and sooner than later, in fact, very much sooner than later, because of the way things are accelerating in the news, and we were told, the four seals, when they uh, increase in frequency and increase in intensity, that's blooming to near blossom. And the blossoming means the fifth seal opens up, the three and a half years of great tribulation that precede Christ's return on the seventh trumpet of the seventh seal. All right, let's go. Uh, let me change this to the screen that's got Mr. Armstrong. Uh, well, we'll just fade to that screen. It's going to open in black. And I'll go ahead and put Mr. Armstrong's lower third up there so when it's black, we'll at least have that. And then just a second or two later, the next telecast will begin with God's end-time apostle and most faithful servant, Herbert W. 
Armstrong. The World Tomorrow. The Worldwide Church of God presents The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. Time is running out. Armageddon is closer day by day. Troubles, even wars between nations, are increasing all the time. The Falkland crisis and the Poland crisis. What is going to develop out of the Middle Eastern strife, out of the many other trouble spots all around the world? Just how near are we to the nuclear World War III right now? Are we living in the last days? Well, only Bible prophecies can tell you that. Bible prophecies tell you what is going to happen in general from here on out. Not the details, but in general. And we can know a great deal about it. The book of Revelation is the chief book of prophecy in the New Testament. So I would like to come now to the 17th chapter of Revelation. And verse 3, So he, the angel that was revealing these things to him, carried me away in the spirit, or in vision, and incidentally, John, who wrote the Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. He sent and signified it, by his, uh, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And John wrote it. Now, he wrote what he saw in a vision. And it was all in symbol. And here is some of the vision that he wrote in the 17th chapter. So he, the angel that was revealing these things to him, carried me away in the spirit, or in vision, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Now that's a peculiar kind of an animal. A scarlet-colored beast, and here's a woman riding this beast. And the beast is full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now that certainly is a very peculiar type of a beast. There were ten horns on this beast. It had seven heads and ten horns. And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings, kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet. That is at the time of the vision. And the vision was for the far future. In other words, it's for our day now. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast, with this beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb. Now here the Lamb is a symbol for Christ. Christ at his second coming. Now notice that they're going to make war with Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Christ has never been Lord of lords and King of kings. He will be the Lord of lords and the King of kings at the time of his second coming. And Christ's second coming is not far away now. It's within the lifetime of most of us living now. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That is speaking there, actually, of the church. Now, that's a peculiar kind of a beast. But what do they mean by beast? And what is it a symbol of? The book of Revelation is speaking in symbols. 
And here it speaks of a rather weird beast. Well, that refers us immediately back to the 13th chapter of Revelation. And verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now John is speaking of what he seemed to be in, in the vision. He seemed to be standing on the seashore. And he was speaking uh, really of the Mediterranean Sea. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this seems to be referring to the same or certainly a similar beast to that in the 17th chapter. And upon his horns, ten crowns. Now the crowns were not on the heads, the crowns are on the horns. And there were ten horns coming out of the seven heads of this beast. And upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now that becomes more weird than ever. It was like a leopard. It wasn't a leopard, but it had the characteristics of a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. He had the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. You see, he wasn't like a lion, he wasn't like a bear, but he had the feet of a bear, he had the body of a leopard, and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now you have to turn over to the 12th chapter to find out who and what the, the dragon represents. That is another symbol that represents something. And there it'll tell you the dragon is that old serpent called Satan the devil. Satan the devil gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now what do these things symbolize? Just what do they mean? Well, now we have to go back still further to understand because the Bible interprets its own symbols. And so Daniel interprets these symbols. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, we begin to find a lot more about it. So we turn immediately next back to the seventh chapter of Daniel and that will describe this beast of the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel, had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. He was asleep in bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Again, this is speaking of the Mediterranean Sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea. Now, he doesn't see one beast. He sees four different beasts, you will notice, coming up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Each one was different from the other. Now, the first was like a lion, and I behold another beast, a second, like a bear, and after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard. Now it's beginning to resemble what we saw in the 13th chapter. The first was like a lion, the second like a bear, the third was like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and this beast had also four heads and dominion was given unto it. Now what could this beast be? It had four heads. Well, the lion had one head, and the bear had a head, but the leopard had four heads. So now we have six heads so far, and dominion was given unto it. And that sounds like government. Well, let's go further and see. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, signified by iron, stronger than the other, and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and 
it was diverse from all of the others, different from the others. Now we read that the uh, uh, one beast had different characteristics in the 13th chapter, but we see the same things here. We see the uh, lion and the bear, the leopard, and now we see a fourth beast. And it had 10 horns. Now here are 10 horns on the fourth beast. Now the other beast didn't seem to have any horns. So we see that the 10 horns were on the fourth beast. Now next we come down to the 17th verse. These great beasts or wild animals, which are four, are, now here we begin to see what they represent. What do the beasts of symbols, what do they represent? The 13th chapter didn't tell us, the 17th chapter of Revelation didn't tell us, but here in Daniel it does tell us. They are four kings or kingdoms, are four kings, and it's, as we'll see later, synonymous with kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. They arise out of the earth. The kingdoms, although he saw the animals arise out of the sea. But it says here, the saints, in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever, and so on. Now verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be not a fourth king, but a fourth kingdom upon the earth, a kingdom or government, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, as these beasts were diverse or different, that is, one from the other, and shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the uh, kingdom, out of the fourth beast, are ten kings or other kingdoms that shall arise. Now in verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, it's not in heaven, it was on the earth, and the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, will take over the government that these governments had been ruling on the earth. The saints will take them over and all dominions shall serve and obey him, which is referring to Christ at his second coming, and the saints will be ruling under him, as you will read in the second and third chapters of, of Revelation. If we overcome, we will sit with him on his throne. If we are overcomers, we will be given power over the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, as you read in other places in the book of Revelation. Now then, we know something about that these are kings and kingdoms and governments. But what kings, what governments are them? We still don't know. It doesn't reveal it here. We have to go back still further now back into the second chapter of Daniel. We go all the way back into the second chapter of Daniel now. And Daniel was called on to uh, reveal a dream to the then reigning King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there had been many ancient city-states, just cities that were governments in themselves, finally became whole nations, of which was Egypt, ancient Egypt, and, and there was ancient Greece, and other nations of that sort. But the first world empire, growing into a group of nations as an empire, was formed by this Nebuchadnezzar, about 604 B.C. This Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the first world empire, had a dream. And Daniel, the prophet Daniel, one of the Jewish lads in the captivity who had been taken captive when uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his army had overcome the kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem and conquered them and brought them as slaves into Babylon. And Daniel was a very brilliant young Jewish lad who was giving an important part in the government. 
And they learned that somehow God revealed dreams and things to him. And so he was brought in to this King Nebuchadnezzar who had a great dream. He had called the uh, fortune tellers and all those people in the kingdom in to tell him the dream. And of course, they couldn't tell him what he dreamed. And he claimed he had forgotten and he was just testing them. But Daniel said, there was a God in heaven that would reveal it to him. And so he prayed to God for the revelation of the dream that this king had had. Now I come to the second chapter and verse 28 in Daniel, where Daniel said before this king Nebuchadnezzar, but there is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, getting down to our time now, the last days. I mentioned a booklet several times recently. Let me mention it once again. Are we living in the last days? That's a booklet I have. Are we living in the last days? Because here is a prophecy about our time now, in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed were these. Now he went on to describe it. I will just say that he saw an image that was so great it was terrifying. And it had a great head of fine gold. It had a breast and arms of silver, a belly and thigh of brass. And it had legs of iron, strong and feet and toes, part of iron and part of miry clay, especially the ten toes on the feet. And the, the, the king had seen such a vision, but he didn't understand what it was. And Daniel came to tell him, Thou, O king, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. He was a king of kings. In other words, a number of nations. There were other nations under him. He said, the God of heaven have given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. Then he continues, thou art this head of gold. Now we begin to understand the meaning of these symbols. And after thee shall arise another kingdom or another world empire inferior to thee, just as silver is inferior to gold, but silver is a little stronger than gold and militarily it was going to be stronger, but spiritually or morally it was inferior. And another third kingdom of brass, again still inferior morally or spiritually, but stronger materially and in military power, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now we know that's not some magic man coming to bear rule over the earth. This is the ancient kingdom of the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Now we know what that was. That was the Roman Empire. Now we come to verse 44. And in the days of these kings, which was speaking of the feet and the ten toes, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. It will rule all of the nations of this earth together. And it shall stand forever. Now that's getting down to our day. And it shows that Christ's coming is going to smite this whole image representing the governments of this world on the toes. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, in other words, not human hands, but coming supernaturally from God, which is the coming of Christ in power and glory as the king of kings to rule all nations, and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. And that, my friends, is the kingdom of God. And speaking of Christ coming, 
to set up and to rule the kingdom of God. And so here we have it all the way through. So you can see that Daniel saw it in four wild animals. The first was like a lion. That was equivalent to the head of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And the second was the uh, bear with the strong feet. And that was equivalent to the uh, next kingdom that followed, the Persian Empire. And the third beast that Daniel saw in the seventh chapter was like a leopard, swift and cat-like, uh, very rapid and fast. And it had four heads. That was the Greco-Macedonian Empire. Now, Philip of Macedon died when he was just going to start a war. And his son, Alexander, who became known as Alexander the Great, took it up. And he had the swiftest army that the world had ever known like a leopard. He came down and conquered the whole world. He died in a drunken debauch. He said he died in despair because there were no more worlds to conquer. He'd conquered all the world, and he knew in those days the whole world centered around the eastern Mediterranean, as far as they knew in those days. And in his stead came up four divisions, each headed by one of his four generals of his army, and that represented the four heads of Daniel's third beast, like a leopard. And then the fourth beast that Daniel had, strong like iron, was the same as the Roman Empire, which followed that with the strength of iron and ruling the whole world at that time, ruling on the west, ruling all of the east, on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Roman Empire fell in 476 A.D. It was restored as the Holy Roman Empire, it was called, in 554 A.D. And that continued until 1814. Now, the Bible says it is to be revived once again, a revival of the so-called Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. Now the ten toes will be ten nations forming in Europe, and then it is going to end. The stone that will smite it on the feet is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he's going to set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God, that will rule over all the nations of the world, and it will last forever. I wonder if you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ was suppressed within 21 or 22 years after he preached it. It had been suppressed and was not preached in the world until now. And Jesus Christ himself in the 24th chapter of Matthew was asked for a sign of his second coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end of this world come. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom, the government of God, it's the family of God, the born again family of God, not born again into human beings, but born again into divine beings. You see, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit, said Jesus Christ, is spirit. And we are not spirit. And nobody who is, for, is, is flesh and blood is born again or has been born again. But we have a lot of people, even a few million of them, claiming to be born again now. And they are simply deceived. That is not scriptural. It's not according to the word of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was the kingdom of God about a government. And we, Christians, and the church is merely the kingdom of God being trained and having the Holy Spirit of God and learning the way of life of God, of God's way of life to be changed from mortal to immortal, from human to divine, and to rule over all nations under Christ when he comes in his second coming to rule. That, my friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has not been proclaimed for 1950 years. 
and is being proclaimed this minute in your ears, and you're listening to it. And it's time that we begin to heed it. Now, I want to go on a little further in this and in a little more detail in the book of Revelation. We'll put that off till later. But meantime, that mysterious book of Revelation, it is unveiled now so you can understand it. And here I have a book that I'd like to offer to you, the book of Revelation unveiled at last. I've read to you in previous programs how in Daniel, the 12th chapter, the prophecy that was given to Daniel, which runs right along with the book of Revelation, was closed and sealed until the time of the end, when many would run rapidly to and fro, like we do on automobiles and airplanes and every way of speed today, and knowledge would be increased. Oh, what a time of increase of knowledge. But here the book of Revelation is open to our understanding at last, and you can understand it, and it tells of the events that are going to open up the way. Now, I'm going to show you later that this beast of the 17th chapter of Revelation is a coming United States of Europe that is being formed right now. And that will bring on the great tribulation and that will end in the second coming of Christ, the end of this present civilization of this world and the beginning of the wonderful world tomorrow. All right, brethren, there we are with uh, two telecasts today from Mr. Armstrong, two very important telecasts. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. And... Thanks for joining us today, brethren. I uh, I believe uh, because time is such that we really need to sober ourselves, as you were hearing Mr. Armstrong speak with urgency, because things are indeed happening today that that if he could see what's happening today, he'd say he would be shocked to see any of us playing around anymore. And that book he mentioned that is of uh, was most important beside the book on the book of revelation unveiled the book he mentioned um, united states and britain and prophecy i mentioned that earlier we've got that uh we read through that if you go to our archive at cogtv.org you can find chapter by chapter reading of that but here's what i plan to do later we got to sign off now because we're near the two hour point for services but I am planning, after I go downstairs, have some broth, uh, a couple hours later, I'm coming back for an afternoon service. So we've had Friday night Bible study service this, this morning. Those have primarily given us four telecasts so that we can make headway before the fall feast and hopefully finish all of the chapters of Mystery of the Ages. I am setting my mind to coming back for an afternoon from the U.S. live stream where I'll read through chapter 7. We left off, we finished chapter 6. Chapter 6 was a long chapter in Mystery of the Ages. I'm going to come back later, read through chapter 7, as much of it as I can in two hours. That's my plan. And uh, if you're not able to come back with us live later, there will be a recording in the archive you'll be able to find of chapter 7. So um, if you can make it back with us live, that'll be great. If you can't, as I said, if I do come back and read that uh, live, a recording will be in the archive of Chapter 7 later so we can keep plunging ahead and finish off the whole book before the fall festival season begins. All right, brethren, thank you for joining me today here on Sabbath.tv from cogtv.org. And I may be back here again later, as I said, with Chapter 7. I'm hoping to do that later yet today. In the meantime, hope you have a good lunch, an opportunity for a little fellowship, both with brethren and with God and some prayer. And happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>